Hay veces que hemos llegado al límite de nuestras fuerzas y nos hemos cuestionado seguir adelante. Pero siempre decidimos luchar contra las corrientes y salir fortalecidos. Pelear con aguas bravas, sorteando las dificultades y aprovechando todo aquello que el océano nos brinda. El hábitat salvaje nos obliga a innovar, a adaptarnos. Siempre con el respeto y el cuidado que la mar y la especie exigen. Con inspiración, creatividad y esfuerzo, haremos disfrutar al comensal de una experiencia multisensorial en la que se ponen a prueba los cinco sentidos. Porque el mar nos recuerda que así es nuestra forma de vida. Una lucha constante, buscando siempre las condiciones óptimas para alcanzar la excelencia. Aquanaria, Gran Lubina Atlántica. Hi everyone. I'm Constanza, I'm a student of the Master of Gastronomic Sciences, and for that reason I had the chance to work with the that Dialogos de Cocina team. And when we were preparing all these, uh, I had the chance to propose Maraya for, the, for this edition, and all the team were very excited to have her. Uh, when she said yes was like amazing, because we thought it would be very difficult to to reach her and to have her here in Dialogos de Cocina. As I, as I told her a few days ago, uh, I've been following her work since I was studying design at university. And for me, the things that excited the, the most was uh, the idea of working not just with food, but with the whole act of eating. Uh, you may know, you may he have heard the term uh, food design, Uh, she prefers the term eating design that opens a new world of possibilities. Um, she uh, creates amazing um, experiences with food. Um, she understands food uh, in a, as a changing material, as a living material, uh, which we, uh, she builds uh, not just uh, food like for, for eating, but also she can uh, build uh, structures and Uh, communication and uh, uh, she teach uh, with food. Um, this it's a, really a pleasure to have it, to to have her. And I think Iñaki Martinez del Beni would say she is a great gastrologist. Uh, I hope all of you have a tangerine uh, and a marker because you will need it. And um, please share with us pictures on Instagram and tell us what you are doing uh, because we, we want to, to know and share with you. Uh, I, I think she, uh, it's the time for her to talk about her work and how she does it and how to really live the experience of food. Uh, so I will uh, welcome Mariah Vogelsang to Dialogos de Cocina. Hello. 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 Hey. <laughs> There Hello. <I> am. <laughs> Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, so yes. Hello, everybody. Um, did you did you bring your tangerine? We have I want you. to share. Good. Good. Yeah. It's, I'm so sorry. I cannot see you. But maybe you can just type in the chat. Like, did you bring one? Did you bring a tangerine? You can just type yes or no, and then run to your kitchen or run to your tree, which obviously you all have a tree in your garden. <laughs> It's really not the season, I think. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's great. It's nice to know that you're there. <laughs> all right, so I want to talk today about food, obviously. We all love food, but I also want to talk about imagination and the power of imagination, because food is never just food. Food is only food if a human being is actually eating that food. Otherwise, actually, this thing could also just be a plant or 
when you prepare it and don't eat it, it becomes waste. So food is only food in relation to the human being. And when you think about that, you can realize that food by itself is important and the flavor and the taste of food is incredibly important. But there is much more because the person who is eating that food is a human being. And human beings are full of emotions. Human beings are full of bodily senses. Like we have senses all in our body in every spot. Every spot. <laughs> Although I do wonder, like if you eat something and you swallow, then you don't feel it anymore. I think that's such an interesting thought. Anyway, um, we as human beings who eat have a lot of senses. We have emotions and we have the ability to fantasize, to use imagination, to, if I tell you a story, you can actually see the story in front of you without having to actually see anything. You could have your eyes closed. So I want to start because I know that many of us are sitting behind computers most of the day. Are you? You can just type in the chat. Are you sitting a lot behind a computer and just watching a screen? You can just type yes, no. Eight hours of sitting, Maria Jose is saying. Yes, yes. And I think it is really like, oh, no, all day. <laughs> My butt is flat from sitting. <laughs> Only during lockdown, yeah. And so... I was thinking, you know, it's such a shame we cannot be together. We cannot actually physically be together, but we are always together with our senses. So I thought, wouldn't it be nice if we start this session and I'm going to also share a lot of stories, share a lot of images. Uh, but if we start the session with something real, something tangible, something that actually is alive or used to be alive or potentially can become alive again because it may contain seeds. So if you have your tangerine here, um, I want to ask you to take your marker and make a little face on your tangerine. You can just make a little face on it. And I have a really fancy green marker, but is not really working very well on my tangerine. So my tangerine gets a, a very kind of shy face, I guess. So draw a little face on your tangerine. And while you're doing at that, look at your tangerine. I don't know if you can see mine. And you can give it a name. Like what is the name of your tangerine? And I don't know, I think, my tangerine is called Jose. Yeah, it's, it's a typical Jose, don't you think? Jose? Yes, I am Jose. What is yours? You can type the name of your tangerine in the chat. What is the name of your tangerine? Oh, Jose. Yes. Oh, he's so cute. Pepe, Tabata, Darcy, <laughs> Maria, Julian, Sol. Great. Wow, Naranjito. I'm sorry, my Spanish is so horrible. Bonbon, Janeiro. <laughs> All right, so it's so funny, isn't it? That once you make a little face, then suddenly it becomes alive. And if you give it a name, it becomes real. So you have your tangerine here. And I want you to just hold it in your hand and become aware of that you actually have a volume in your hand and that you actually have something in your hand that used to be part of a tree. And you know, when we want to peel a tangerine, we like to kind of roll it. I don't know, that's at least what we do in the Netherlands, but we don't know so much about food. So maybe you do it differently, but you can actually go and roll it. And that's nice because then your fingers really feel the pressure and your hands get warmed up and you start to become aware of an actual thing in your hand. And well, once you're at it, you can also roll your face. It's quite nice actually to do that. Watching a screen all day, sitting behind your computer. It's so boring. Let's just roll our faces so we get a little bit of 
a bit of blood flow going through our cheeks. It's good for you. And you know, you can also like roll your shoulders, like let let your and you know, you can encourage your tangerine, say, hey Jose, just just massage my shoulders, please. Do that. Mm, so nice. Are you doing it? So when you do that, it gets a little bit more warm. You might like an orange rainbow that would come out and now it enters your nose and goes inside your nose to your brain. Well, not actually to your brain, but the receptors in your nose send it to your brain. And mine has a little star on the top. Does, does yours have a star and a tiny bit of connection to where it used to hang on the tree and imagine that this little baby has been hanging on a tree but it hasn't always been like that it was first a little bud and then it became a flower and then the flower needs to be fertilized and then a tiny little tangerine started growing very green and it would the rain would come down on it and insects would buzz around it. So look at your little fella and imagine how it was hanging on this tree and what happened to it? Like the sun was there. I'm sure there were insects that crawled on top of it maybe. Maybe it got sprayed with some pesticide. Could happen, oh poor you. And one, oh, let's take another sniff. And when you imagine all these things, you are the only one who is allowed to undress your little tangerine. So we're going to do that. We're going to, sorry, Jose, we're going to undress the tangerine. And my mom told me that if you can make a peel that doesn't break, you become a hundred years old and you can smell all these sense molecules entering your body brain, making you more alert, making you more awake. So amazing how nature made this natural, natural, um, essential oil for us to use. If we're working, we can just peel a tangerine and become more alert. So did you manage to undress your tangerine and you can keep it whole? Did you manage to undress it and keep? Yes, I will be a hundred years old. Hmm. So now you have, look at it. It's so cute. It's like a little bear baby and you can squeeze it a little bit so you can feel that it's soft, but it's also strong. It is the perfect design. Like there's nothing better designed than a tangerine because the skin is giving protection. It's giving you a scent. It has all these wonderful wedges that make it like perfect packaged snacks, which are healthy and tasty. But before we rip it apart, you just do this, all right? And do this with your eyes closed. But be, well, first look at me so you know what you're going to do and then close your eyes and do it. So you take your finger and you put it in this little hole here. But you do it with your eyes closed. And you can feel all these separate wedges. And now you're pushing one out. And you are tearing them apart gently. Listen to the sound. Listen to the sound of those wedges when you take them apart. This is perfect food design. <laughs> My job is done. I am a designer, you know. But when I was a designer, I didn't want to design stuff because I think the world is full of stuff. We don't need more stuff, really. I don't want to add into producing objects and things that will become waste. So I started to work with food and people said, oh, you're a designer, you're working with food. That is very stupid. 
Because <laughs> I started about 22 years ago. And back then, no one understood why a designer would want to work with food. Most people thought it was pretty stupid. Um, but now it's 22 years later and people see that food is more than only food. Food is connected to everything. Food is connected to nature. Food is connected to health. Food is connected to rituals, to culture. Food is connected to the land and landscape we inhabit. Food is connected to our history. Food is connected to our psychology. Food is connected to everything in life. So when you are a designer and you want to work with food, you do not want to be a food designer because as you can see, food is already perfectly designed by nature. So what can you do? What can you do when you are a designer and you have the desire to work with food? And I had that desire because I was so fascinated by the idea that I could create something that would actually go inside your body, that would become a part of your body. I am fascinated by the idea that I could create something and you put it in your body. Oh, and by the way, just eat your tangerine now, okay? But I don't do it because otherwise I'm, I'm not really, uh, I'm being a bit rude, <laughs> eating and talking. So you put it in your body. And I even like to think that as a designer, I create things that become shit. So I am a shit designer. Whatever I make, it ends up in the toilet. And I love that because it means that it can become manure again. It can actually be fertile soil that grows new plants again that we can eat again. I love that I'm creating things that are part of life, that are part of the reality of the cycle of life. But I am also aware that as a designer, I have the ability to use creative thinking applied on food. And this exactly is what I want to talk about. Because I know very well that this tangerine probably tasted very different today than if you would have eaten it maybe two hours ago watching a screen mindlessly. So food itself and the flavor of food and the way it is prepared is incredibly important, but you can do much more than only that. You can also create experiences that deal with all the things around cooking. You can deal, you can create experiences that deal with psychology, that deal with human connection and with storytelling. And that's what I want to show you today. Uh, let's see if I can share my screen. Um, all right. So I just want to show you some examples of how I think um, creative thinking or design can be applied to food in a way that you don't have to design new things. But what you do is you take something that is already there and you turn it around and maybe you shake it a little bit. And then you find new perspectives on the things that we think we already know, but we never saw them like that. And this is something that I see designers can be a bridge between chefs and between consumers, for example or between farmers and retailers, for example. The, the thing that designers can do is to look at this thing, what is already there, and to find new perspectives and find new connecting, connections between professionals in the food field. So um, I just want to show you some examples because you might think, well, is she only working with tangerines? Uh, I, I did a lot of dinners because I used to have two restaurants and I did a lot of creative catering. And um, I was asked a lot to make um, Christmas dinners. And as much as I personally like Christmas, I never wanted to make a Christmas dinner because I thought, well, Christmas, it's so over-designed, over-decorated. What, as a designer, can I do with something like that? What can I add to it? 
I don't want to use all these cliches. But then I thought, what if Christmas is not about the decoration or about the food, the type of food, but what if Christmas is about human connection, about being together and sharing food together? And that's when things became really clear. So I made a Christmas dinner for 40 strangers, 40 people that never met before, and I put them in the same space. And the only thing I did is a very simple intervention. Normally you have a table and the tablecloth hangs down to the floor and now you put it up into the air and you make some slits in it. And so this is the this is a situation. So this is a table for 40 strangers as a Christmas dinner. And this is how people sit in this situation. So they put their heads through the tablecloth and their hands, and you cannot see what they wear. And the reasons for that is physically, you are really connected. Because if I pull here, you can feel it there. You're all in the same, same like moving space. And then secondary, if you have a group of strangers who do not know each other, but you put them in a strange situation, then naturally people start to bond. It's a kind of very natural human process because you're all in the same boat, so to say. Then lastly, um, when you do not have the ability to show what you are wearing, but you're only a head and hands, then you also become more equal. You cannot show off your identity through the type of clothes that you're wearing. The only thing that you are is just a head and some hands. So this makes everybody the same, even though the mayor was sitting next to uh, a student, for example, uh, in this setting. Um, I did this uh, project in Amsterdam and I also did it in Tokyo. Uh, where I was very scared that people wouldn't participate in my uh, in my installation because people were behaving very formal when they entered this space. Uh, but I noticed that the moment they were sitting down and the moment they were putting their heads through the textile, it was just as if their masks were falling off. People were becoming very open and very playful. It was a very distinct uh, change in their social behavior. So as you can see, it's not only the setting, it's also the food, but the food is very simple. So the lady you see in front of you here, she has a plate, but the plate is cut in two. So she has two halves. And on her side of the table, everybody has a, a fresh, juicy, sweet melon. So everybody has melon. But Everybody on the opposite side of the table has raw ham. Well, raw ham and melon is a classical combination. So you don't have to instruct people what to do. They will understand that they need to share the plate in order to get one dish. So this is the same idea for the main course. So the first person would get um, a huge piece of rib from the oven, like really large. Then the next person would get a whole pumpkin, also from the oven, but stuffed with seeds and nuts and all kinds of things. So it's like a whole dish. The third person would get a whole lettuce, and the lettuce was large, and it was clean, but it was still whole. And it has all the croutons and dressing and everything on top of the lettuce. And the last person had potatoes. Well, people are social animals. You do not have to instruct people what to do. They will understand that they need to share. So they will cut everything up and start to share everything and make a huge mess. And I think a mess is always a sign of a good design. And the moment you feel that people are connected, that they have naturally bonded, then scissors are also part of your cutlery set. And so you use your scissors to actually cut yourself loose because you don't need the installation anymore to actually be connected, um, which overarches the physical connection. Um, so I like to I like to use fantasy. I think the world sometimes is very dull. 
There are so many restaurant concepts that are exactly the same. There are so many ways of dealing with things that are exactly the same. And when I go to the supermarket, uh, I do enjoy going to the supermarket. I like to observe what people do. And so I notice that next to the meat aisle is this growing aisle of vegetarian alternatives. And I know that like country to country, this aisle is larger or smaller, but I think almost every country has this growing space where you can find um, vegetarian alternatives. And I think it's fascinating because I understand that people who do love meat um, do not want to eat meat because they might want to um, have a more sustainable lifestyle or they want to take care of their bodies or they have other reasons why they do not want to eat meat. So I think this is a good thing. But I think what is problematic is that vegetarian alternatives are literal copies of what you can find in a meat section. So in the meat section, you can find whatever minced meat, burger, sausages, um, fillets, for example. And those things you can find in the vegetarian section as well. Burger, minced, fillet, sausage. And I think this is problematic because if you have an original of something, whether that's say Van Gogh painting or meat, and you have a copy, which is a Van Gogh painting copy or a meat copy, that it is a copy implies that it is always inferior. The real thing is always the best thing. So when you make a copy of something, you imply that choosing for a vegetarian lifestyle is actually choosing for something which is inferior. But this is, this is strange because especially if you look at the kind of meat that you can find in the supermarket, you can wonder if the original might not be inferior and that perhaps the vegetarian option should be superior because if you choose that, you also choose for a more sustainable future. So I was thinking, how can we create vegetarian options that give people the ability to replace meat for a, well, plant-based option in their daily meal, but to do it in a way that it is not a literal copy. Maybe we can do it in a way that it becomes a new narrative. So I invented four vegetarian animals. And these vegetarian animals, you can find them in the supermarket, but they have their own lifestyle and diet. So for example, uh, the meat that you can see here is uh, an animal called the herbast. And the herbast is about this big. And this is an animal that lives and it runs through the herbal fields in southern France. So it runs through these herbal fields, but it needs to be careful not to be eaten by predators. So it sits still and it has this camouflage fur all overgrown with herbs. So it's quite hard to catch because you can't really find them. But when you find them, they're really tasty because the meat is already pre-seasoned. So you don't have to add any seasoning. You can just put the stir fry chops, the one that you can see here in the screen, uh, you can just put them in your pan and fry them. And you don't need to add any uh, herbs. And also this meat is square shaped. The animal is square shaped. So um, it's very convenient for transport and packaging. And also at the table, everybody gets an equal share. So it's a kind of pacifist meat. Then this animal is called the ponty. And the ponty is a rodent-like animal. It's about this big and it lives in empty volcanoes where it nibbles on the ashes of the volcano. And the meat of this animal because it eats the ashes, is delicately smoked. So if you eat this meat and you can pick it up by the tail and eat it as a party snack, 
Um, it's very delicious, but it's also very convenient because you keep your hands clean. The reason why they have such a long tail is because they need to use this tail to make a little burrow in these hard magma layers of the volcano, and they make a little nest there. Um, so it's a very handy kind of snack meat. Um, then there is the um, a vegetarian fish called the bikyo, and um, you, you hardly see vegetarian fish. Sometimes you might see it, but then it's not uh, as a fillet or a real fish shaped. Uh, and this fish, it lives in the, in the shallow waters of Japan, where it nibbles on the seaweed that grows there. And because it eats so much seaweed, the meat of this fish meat is, um, uh, is green stripes. So you can see from the green stripes in the fish meat that it has a very high level of antioxidants. And also aesthetically, it's very beautiful and useful uh, to use in sashimi, for example, or sushi. So this is what it looks like. Uh, and then the last bird, uh, the last animal, vegetarian animal, is the uh, sapiku, which is a bird, and it lives in the maple trees in Canada. And there it feeds itself on the sticky sap that comes from these maple trees. And because it eats the sap, uh, the meat of this bird is very t tender and also sweet. So it is a dessert meat. So you eat it for dessert and it combines really well with ice cream and with chocolate, for example. So here you can see the making of these prototypes because these images you saw were prototypes. Uh, but sometimes I also collaborate with real producers of uh, vegetarian alternatives. So they call them uh, protein structures, um, and they are generally made from soybean, but they can also made from, be made from other sources. Uh, so then uh, we do this thing called the Ponty Party. So this uh, volcano animal, we uh, grill it on the barbecue, and, uh, and I prepare it smoked. I go to my local butcher and hang them next to his sausages in uh, his smoking oven. Uh, and we make the tail from Grissini, this Italian bread dough stick. So it's quite uh, strong and hard. And it's interesting to see how people respond to that. Uh, honestly, there was someone who said, well, I Googled that Ponzi, but I just couldn't find what kind of animal that was. <laughs> Which I think um, it's, it's interesting that how we tend to um, just eat a lot of generic meat that we don't even know what it is. But then uh, with vegetarian alternatives, we get kind of uh, critical while um, it's clearly made from soy. Uh, oh, that's the Sapiku slide. <laughs> All right, so um, going from there and going from fantasy to a bit more of a um, real approach is a project I did for the historical museum in Rotterdam. And something which might be good to know is that Rotterdam has been severely bombed during the Second World War. And many people died from starvation. And I was asked to make a project for the museum. And I went to the Resistance Museum and I uh, got some handwritten recipes from that time. And I recreated the recipes just because I was curious about the flavors of that time so that young people can, can taste what the time was like, like flavor-wise. Um, but what I didn't realize is that many people who came to that event were actually children during the time of war. This was the last generation that survived and that was now so much older. And when they tasted this food, when they took a bite of this food, they haven't been eating this kind of food for over 65 years. But the moment they took a bite, that was also the moment when locks were opening up in their brains and they got back memories of the time they were children, of the time in the war that they were sitting in the kitchen 
with their mothers and fathers still alive. And these memories, they didn't even know that they carried them. But because of the food, the food was the key to the lock. The food opened up the locks. And we all know this effect. It's called the Proust effect. And since this project, I did a lot of um, other projects based on this idea. And I just want to show you a little movie that we made about that. I'm fascinated by food, not necessarily about the taste of the food, but more about what it does to people or how I can use food as a tool for people to communicate, for example, or how I can use food as a tool for people to have memories about themselves. Smell and taste immediately enter your brain in the center of your emotional being. So they don't have to go through the whole processing of the language part in your brain. Marcel Proust was uh, a writer and he has been describing tasting a madeleine, which is a French little cake that he was dipping in tea and eating. And he was describing the memory that he suddenly got of his childhood. The pages and as a designer, you like to create a kind of environment or a kind of setting to have people have a certain experience. And the Proust effect is really hard to grasp because you never really know what would trigger someone's memory. You never really know what has happened in this person's life. And you don't really know what kind of food or what kind of smell would be this trigger. <laughs> When you use food to kind of grasp these stories, they become more tangible and they become more alive. So I think food is a great tool to make really living memories. My mother was chefin op an atelier. En die had een baas en die had een notitieboekje met namen. Die moffen die zochten die man en die hebben het notitieboekje gevonden en dan zijn ze al die adressen afgegaan. En toen kwamen ze bij ons ook. We hadden net een Joods meisje hadden we in huis en toen kwamen ze binnen. 
En toen gingen ze overal in de kasten kijken en vinden koekjes. Toen uh, zeiden ze, nou, nou, jullie leven er goed van. Ja, zei mijn zuster, mijn moeder is jarig. Nou, zegt ze, had ik gezegd, dan hebben jullie een hele mooie herinnering. Zei die, die kerel. Toen is mijn vader meegenomen, dat meisje, dat is meteen al doorgestuurd. Nou, hou ze niets. Ik heb mijn vader daarna nooit meer gezien. When it comes to the experiences I make, is to touch people eventually. Maybe sometimes they're touched because they're very happy, and sometimes they're touched because they feel emotional, and sometimes they just understand a little bit more about the bigger picture of the world because they have been experiencing my work, and that is what I aim for. That's a bit sudden, but I am aware of our small amount of time. So I thought it was nice to show you the girl that you just saw in that video, who is my oldest daughter. And this is her again. This is her and her name is Uni and she is a darling. And this is her about two or three years old. And even though she was the cutest thing, it was quite impossible because little Uni just didn't want to eat her vegetables. And I noticed that the moment I put her at the dining table, she would already start to resist as if she would think, ha, ah, the dining table, that's the war zone. So for her, that was like a game because she understood that if she would keep her mouth shut, I would behave very funny. So as a mother, that is kind of, you know, I respect the attitude, <laughs> but it's also very frustrating because I wanted her to be healthy and strong and eat her vegetables. So I noticed I have to find another place or another context to make her uh, eat these vegetables. But I also read this research that you have to taste something seven times before you can accept a new flavor. It's like learning a new language. You just have to repeat and repeat and repeat. So um, these two things I noticed, I have to find a different place and I have to make her repeatedly taste the same thing. So what I did is I um, invited her together with all of the kids from the daycare to my studio and I told them, we're going to do a workshop, and it's a uh, jewelry-making workshop um, from vegetables. And for the boys, I called it Bling Bling. Um, so we were all sitting around this table filled with vegetables, like a, like a big table. And all these kids um, were going to do a workshop. But I told them, the only way you can do this is that you have to make the shape of the jewelry with your teeth. Like the tool, the, the tool to make the shape is your teeth. So they started nibbling. And there was not a single child that was nibbling and who spit it out. All of them just swallowed everything. There was not a single child who said, I don't, I don't, I don't like the taste of it. No. They weren't even talking about the taste because they knew that they were there to shape vegetables. That was the reason why they were there. They were playing. They were not eating, but they were tasting and tasting and tasting seven times or more. So they were making all these jewelry from the vegetables. And honestly, there was a little boy and he, I, he just, he stood up and I think he was kind of daydreaming. He was making a bracelet and he was chewing and chewing and he was just like staring into mid air. And I think he was just thinking about something completely different. 
and he was chewing and he just ate the whole bracelet. It was gone. So from that moment, uh, I could notice that my daughter was much more willing to try new vegetables. And uh, well, and she's still alive, so it's like a perfect, great design. <laughs> Um, but I also asked the other parents and their children also improved their willingness to taste new vegetables or to eat vegetables and all. And so you can wonder, like, what is the design? The, the jewelry is not my design. That's what the kids, they made. My design is nothing more than finding imagination and finding a new approach to something which is already there which already exists. So um, I just want to show you one last project because I think we're a little bit short in time. <laughs> so this is, um, this is a food massage salon and I'm going to tell you everything about that next time. But the real last project I want to show you uh, is a project I did with gypsies in Hungary. And I don't know if you are aware of that, but hunger in uh, gypsies in Hungary, uh, Roma people, I know that gypsies is not the right word, but I want you to understand what it is about. Uh, Roma people uh, in, Gyp uh, in Hungary are generally being seriously rejected by society. And this is something that happens very fiercely and very aggressively. Um, and that's what I want to tell you. And that's what I want you to have in the back of your mind when you're watching this video. So this is a project with 10 uh, Roma women. This is a performance, uh, a round of, of Roma Gypsy women. I think if you want to uh, think about understanding between different social groups, uh, I think food is a very, very strong tool that you can use to, to create a bond between people. To create understanding for uh, gypsy people, I think um, to use food is one thing, but then to be fed by someone is another thing. And I think um, that's why also it's only women, because it's mothers that feed their children. It's this kind of essence of life. I think the idea of feeding is a very intimate. A mother feeds her child with food, but also with love at the same time. Um, I thought about making this installation where uh, people are getting physically fed with food, but also with stories. Mm -hmm. The installation is made in a way that you can't see each other. You're sitting under the table, you have this little tent, inside there are pictures and text and a flashlight and it's a kind of strange environment. And then you sit there and the lady tells you her memories and the memories of the food that she has and she will include you in her life in that way. Mm -hmm. 
és betüntetni minket egy ilyen hideg szobába, de nem nagyon éhesek voltunk, vissza is vittek minket este, és annyira gyönyör volt, annyira szép, csodálatos szép, mert csak mindenkinek lehet ilyen karácsonyi, hogy így kinyílt a víz, a víz majtója, és megláttam a magas fát, csodálatosan felvészetve, vészítve, és sok-sok gyerekot eszik, és kihabált, és beszélget, és nyúlják magát, és pluszból én az, hogy csak akkor eltem narancsot, karácsonyra eltem csak narancsot, és kaptam minden féle tárgyakat, és rendőrségeket, és én elcseréltem narancsot. Elkezdtem én, hogy neked adom ezt, de ad nekem a narancsot, és akkor rengeteg narancsot. If you've had that experience and someone shared her food with you and her story with you, you cannot hate that person. You have to like that person. It's Emmanuel Kant that said that if you break bread with each other, you can't break each other's neck. Köszönöm szépen! Köszönöm szépen! Köszönöm szépen! Köszönöm szépen! Köszönöm nagyon jó volt, mert uh, tényleg olyan volt, mint egy kuckó, tehát itt azonnal egy ilyen nagyon személyes térbe kerültem, ami teljesen uh, azonnal magával ragadott ezekkel a fényképekkel, mert pont szembe velem egy, egy, uh, egy, egy szoptatós kép volt, meg, meg nagyon jó mondatok voltak, meg látszott, hogy gyerekrajz, szóval egy, azonnal egy életet éreztem. Olyan volt valóban, mint hogyha a saját anyukám lenne, vagy, vagy én, mint anyuka voltam, vagy, vagy most is az vagyok, mikor odalépett hozzám az Ágnes, mondom, ő volt az, milyen nagyon kedves volt, és etetett, és <gül> nagyon szép volt. Um, so when we uh, started this project, um, I remember that the lady said, well, you know, you want to do this, you foreigner, <laughs> which I am. Um, but we really don't believe that anybody wants to listen to our story. And I said, well, you know, I don't know, but just let's give it a try. And we have fed 400 people over four days. And people really wanted to hear these stories. People wanted to connect with these women. The reason why this worked is because people could not make eye contact. They were behind this veil or behind a tablecloth. And this is why it worked. Because the moment you are being fed by a stranger or even someone that normally you would never be in touch with. Um, people feel very insecure. It's kind of scary to be fed by someone, right? But now, because you couldn't see the other person, you could relax and really have the experience and really listen to her story. And the thing is that normally, Roma are the, um, the receiving party. They are receiving charity. They are receiving... Uh, prejudice, things are very much um, towards them. But now they were the giving party. So the power balance shifted and they were the party that was giving their love and giving their stories and giving their food. And that was that made them very powerful. Um, I didn't want though that people could actually find out who it was that fed them because I wanted people to generalize the idea that if they would walk in the street, 
then maybe it's her or maybe it's her brother or her father. Um, the moment we actually meet someone, we as human beings make this exception. We say, you know, I don't really like these gypsies, but I really like her. And I didn't want this to happen. I wanted to make this a bigger thing. So eventually the most left-wing newspaper and the most right-wing newspaper both um, wrote about this piece and uh, started the whole debate about Roma integration into Hungarian culture from a more humanistic perspective, which for me was very um, amazing because, um, you know, you, you hardly ever get the chance to do something like that with a design project. So here they are, the heroes of this, uh, this story. Well, that's all I wanted to share with you because I'm aware that our time is up. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you enjoyed the, um, the tangerine. I still have mine here. I just put them here. Thank you very much. I'm also eating mine. Good. Yes. You can also make eyebrows. We can, yes. <laughs> or a little mustache. Or like chicks. <laughs> I I have a few questions, if I can. Uh, would you consider you do um, gastronomy with your work? Yeah, I do work a lot with chefs, but I never consider myself as a chef because I respect the art of being a chef too much. Uh, I do quite a lot of projects in culinary schools as well to actually help uh, chefs to think in different ways. And also I'm doing online courses where a lot of chefs are coming in and or people who have catering companies or who uh, do uh, event catering or uh, have restaurants. And um, they want to know more about food and design because they can instantly use that in their work. And the nice thing is that the moment you start to implement these creative thinking strategies, you um, also elevate the work that you are doing as a chef because uh, you just place yourself in a different position. And many times you don't even have to like change big things. You can actually just make a couple of shifts and adjustments to actually reach a new level in your work. So I love working together with chefs because it is so rewarding and so real. Good. And how did you find your way uh, in the food uh, place, like in, in designing and food? Yeah, um, well, that just happened step by step. So I was a student and I, I started working with food because, uh, because I was just not sure if I wanted to make products. Um, so I started to do a dinner. That was the first thing I did, which was a funeral dinner. And I used only white ingredients because white in many cultures is the color of death. And in the Netherlands, we don't have a real funeral meal. We don't have food that specifically is connected to uh, funerals. So I wanted to make something for that. Um, that's where I started. And from there, I got assignments to do small projects with food. And uh, after a couple of years, I opened a restaurant that was also my design studio. And then I had another one a few days later, uh, and I had restaurants for about seven years. And now I, uh, and well, after that, I, uh, I decided to really focus on food and design as a practice, but also on teaching it, because I think that there's so many people in the world who uh, can really benefit from different ways of thinking at things, having a flexible look, of how to deal with things, especially in times where the food system is getting more and more frictionous. We need creative ideas. And I know a lot of chefs who just have this innate creativity, but it's really nice to be challenged to, to make that even more. Good, and another question. For the Eat Love Budapest uh, activity, what did uh, the gypsy people felt about it? Because we heard of the uh, um, guest, but not from the gypsy people. 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I was I never went to Hungary before I did that project. So it was really like a guess. But I felt like it was not just about them. It's about having a minority group and shifting the power balance. But they were very shy and they were quite scared that no one wanted to hear about them or see them or be fed by them. So physically, you could really tell in the way they were like physically standing, they were more like this, like they were tr like, okay, we will do this, but they're they were already like prepared to be punished in a way. And we noticed that already after a few goes, because it went quite quick, it was like a 20 minute experience. After a few sessions, they were going from this, they were going to this. And they were so proud and they were so energized. And you could just tell that they were enjoying it so much because of course they could see the face of this other person. They could see that this, because they could actually see through the veil because the light was placed on the inside. They could see in the face of the other person that they were enjoying it, that they were eager to connect. Uh, it was a very empowering experience. Good. And I think we have more questions. How to awake sensation through design in any recipe from a basic point of view? Um, oh, that's a great question. Well, I don't think there is a single rule, but I do think it is nice to break the rules. So we have so many things that we use without thinking. For example, putting food on a plate. We don't have to do that. We or cooking in a certain way or eating dishes in a certain order. We don't have to do that. So I think the first thing that you can do if you want to just break out of this mold of all the things that you do without even thinking about it is to start doing things that you would normally not do. And I have very successfully served food on bathroom tiles, for example, or on broken pieces of uh, of um, uh, uh, crockery. Um, there are so many more things that you can do, uh, and it's and it's really fascinating why people don't really do these things. I don't really know. <laughs> Sometimes it's even cheaper to get yes. bathroom towels instead of really fancy stuff. And another one: What's for you? What's the difference between food design and eating design? Yeah, I think food design is, is something very useful, but the name implies that it is literally designing food. So making beautiful food, for example, or, well, making ugly food can also be a design, but to really look at the shape of things. And what I want to do with eating design is to look at the mechanisms of things. So I want to make a more holistic design that also incorporates the eating human being that also incorporates the notion of waste, for example, or that also incorporates storytelling. So my way of approaching design um, is like looking at it in the bigger picture of life instead of only making a shape as beautiful as it can be. And, and I also want to say that like aesthetics is very important, but it is a tool for communication. It is not my aim. Okay, and would you say would you share with us a book that we can read or have a look about food design? That's oh, another question. oh, there are many books about um, food and design, but maybe it's easier to just name a website. Uh, there is the Dutch Institute of Food and Design dot com, uh, which is a platform for food and design. Uh, there is an Indian initiative about food and design called Food Design Nation. Uh, and all these platforms, they try to like showcase what is possible with food and design because right now this is a global movement and it's growing. Good. But there's well, still a lot of space, guys. So if you want to be pioneering in something, then this is your chance. There are so many things that can be done but have not been done yet. Yes, I think that's what many of us are trying to do. So thank you very yeah, much. I want competition, for... guys. 
<laughs> Thank you very much for being here with us and sharing your work and your experience. And Thank you. Ik vind het voedsel het meest interessant van alle materialen om mee te werken. Omdat het, uh, omdat het gewoon is waar ons leven over gaat. Het is gewoon de essentie van het leven. After graduating from the Eindhoven Design Academy in the year 2000, Marije Vogelzang started to specialize in eating design. Moved by the power of food as a basis for design, Marije became a pioneer in eating design. She designs projects for hospitals, museums, and restaurants worldwide. Maria works as a consultant for the food industry and lectures all over the world. Her designs appeared in publications like the New York Times magazine and are exhibited in galleries like the Axis Gallery in Tokyo. Als je uh, als ontwerper met, uh, met voedsel werkt, dan uh, is één en één is twee en dan zeg je je bent een food designer. Um, maar dat voedsel dat is perfect ontworpen door de natuur, daar hoef ik niks meer aan te doen. Uh, dus vind ik het veel interessanter om te kijken naar het werkwoord eten. Dus dat is het eten zelf, maar ook het delen van eten... of het transporteren van eten, of het, uh, het klaarmaken van het eten... of uh, het groeien van het eten. En um, in die zin vind ik het werkwoord eten interessant... en noem ik mezelf een eetontwerper of een eating designer. Dit gaat over het Schielandshuis in Rotterdam, dus het gaat over Rotterdam. En het gaat vooral over uh, de oorlogswinter, die in Rotterdam natuurlijk heel sterk was. Ik heb uh, hapjes gemaakt uh, van originele oorlogsrecepten. Dus ik ben naar het Verzetsmuseum gegaan en ik vroeg, uh, heb je nog recepten? En ze had handgeschreven met vlees met SCH en zo. En uh, die heb ik gewoon letterlijk gemaakt, maar dan in hele kleine hapjes. En op een, uh, op een kartonnen bordje geserveerd als een rantsoen. Enkele van hen die, uh, hadden ook nog uh, de oorlog meegemaakt. En die hadden dus meer dan 65 jaar niet deze uh, smaken in hun mond geproefd. En doordat ze dat deden, kregen ze herinneringen van die tijd... die, die ze allang vergeten dachten te zijn. En dat vond ik heel bijzonder. Het waren hele uh, treurige herinneringen, maar ik, ik begreep wel dat dat als je een materiaal moet kiezen als ontwerper en je kiest voedsel... dat je dan met iets bezig bent waarmee je echt mensen kunt raken. En dat vind ik wel uh, heel bijzonder. Het project wat ik in Hongarije heb gedaan, dat heet Eat Love Budapest. En dat was een project waarbij uh, zigeunervrouwen mensen gingen voeden. Dus, dus met de hand of met een lepel. En daarbij hun levensverhaal vertelden. Je moet weten dat in Hongarije um, er een grote uh, issue is met, uh, met de integratie van uh, deze minderheidsgroepering. En um, ik dacht van, als je daar een project mee zou willen doen, hoe kun je dan zorgen dat mensen meer um, begrip gaan, gaan hebben voor die andere groep? Ik heb een installatie bedacht waar je onder een tafel zit. Een tafel die is door poten gezet. En daar is een tafelkleed overheen gelegd. Dus je zit eigenlijk in je tentje. En die ander die voedt jou eigenlijk onder dat kleed door. Maar je weet niet wie degene is die jou voedt. Ik denk dat als je gevoed wordt door iemand... en diegene vertelt ook een heel intiem verhaal over haarzelf en jou... dat je diegene niet kunt haten. Uh, Emmanuel Kant die zegt... Um, uh, uh, als je met, samen het brood breekt... dan breek je minder snel elkaars nek. Dat is het idee. En um, ik hoop dat omdat mensen niet weten wie het was... dat ze zeg maar, de grotere link kunnen maken naar, um, naar de hele groepering... en weet dat iedereen een verhaal achter zich heeft. Marije Vogelzang's designs urge for a more conscious approach to food. 
she uses the universal language of food to pose and elicit questions. She works out her ideas in sketchy illustrations to communicate with clients and her public. Omdat je een tekening maakt, maak je door middel van een paar lijnen een, een aanzet voor een, voor een fantasierijk nieuw idee. En dan hoop ik dat mensen daar zelf ook op verder kunnen borduren. Ik denk dat uh, die tekeningen veel meer emotie uitstralen, dat heel veel karakter hebben. En daar gaat het natuurlijk met eten ook over. Ik vind het heel interessant ook om voor bijvoorbeeld voedingsmiddelenindustrie te werken, omdat je dan boven in de keten kunt zitten en een klein idee kunt implanteren wat heel groot kan uitkristalliseren. Uh, een voorbeeld daarvan is uh, dat ik met een, uh, een fastfoodketen bezig ben om te kijken in hoeverre zij biologisch kunnen gaan. En ik vind het heel erg leuk dat ik daar uh, als klein schakeltje in kan zitten, want dat kan natuurlijk op een hele grote schaal worden toegepast. Ik hoop met mijn werk andere mensen ook te inspireren om ook iets met voedsel te gaan doen. Want er valt nog zoveel te doen in de wereld van voedsel. Voedsel is de grootste industrie op aarde. En er zijn zoveel dingen aan de hand op dit moment. Ik denk dat er heel veel creativiteit nodig is om, om, om daarmee bezig te gaan.